do you have an oil leak, coolant leak, maybe even a power steering leak, and you really want to get rid of your engine or at least pull it out so you can take care of those issues? Well, look no further. Today, we're going to show you guys how to pull the engine from a twin turbo Nissan 300ZX. This is our DN1 twin turbo project that we picked up a couple weeks ago, and we began a series on how to NATT swap your Nissan 300ZX. This is the chassis we're gonna be using. We did get an NA engine out of a parts car that we ended up putting full twin turbo swab, oil pan, turbos, down pipes, just a whole nine yards, refreshed, resealed the engine, and retimed it. Now it's ready to drop in and go. But to be able to put the engine in the car, we first need to pull this out and get a nice base that we can start off of. So first things first, let's fire it up and let's pull it up to the shop so we can begin to put it under the knife. It's got a bunch of extra stuff here that doesn't need to be here. Will this be the exact same situation for you? Obviously not, but I should be able to help you guys get enough of an understanding to be able to tackle this yourself and not feel so stressed or worried about it. These are very expensive cars, especially labor wise. So if you have the labor of love, I'm here for you guys. Fires right up every time. And we discovered this has low compression. It smokes really bad when it's warm, and that tells me all I need to know. twin turbo drivetrain. We're going to start with the throttle cover. This car actually has a Z-Spec dress-up kit, so this is going to be a lot different than yours likely because these are mostly going to be Allens instead of 10, 12, and the occasional 14 mil bolts. About everything on this car that you're going to be taking off of the engine wise is 10, 12, and I think your throttle cable is the only 14. You don't have to pull the plenum, we're just going to pull everything connected to the plenum remove your throttle cable just crack one side loose you tighten two nuts against each other to tighten on this bracket and as you pull back on the throttle pull your cable over and slide it out I've seen the throttle cables have this bracket right here and I've seen some with it bounded up here kind of like the cruise control is mounted up there on the balance tube I like to tuck it behind the headlight Next up is our balance tube so we can get access to the fuel rail and also all the wiring harness. Should have all 12 mils holding this on. Pliers for your idle air control hose. Disconnect said vacuum hosing. This is likely ran to a boost gauge or boost controller and this is where it's been using its vacuum source. Pull your balance tube and associated vacuum lines. And if your carbon canister is still hooked up, you will have one nipple back here. Next, let's pull off the fuel system. Before we go and do anything related to this, let's unhook our battery. Also, open our gas cap to relieve any potential pressure. There's a little bit. We actually pull the whole rail off instead of just disconnecting it here and leaving the hard line on. So you'll have 10 mils here. And then I usually pull the hose clamp down here and this one right here and either cut them off if they're original and old like these or work them off with a hammer and some pliers. I'll see how much fuel comes out if we pull the damper side first. Okay, it wasn't too bad. If I do dump the rest of the gas out, I dump it here in the middle of the plenum where it doesn't run off or go anywhere. You may want to disconnect your fuel pressure regulator hardline vacuum over here. I honestly like to just make sure I get all the gas out or get some rags to sit under it and then I lay it right back up here about where we put our throttle cable or I'll get a towel double layer it put it over the fender and tuck it right here behind our hood prop a couple different ways you can do it but whatever way you get it out of your way is usually the best we're actually going to start and we're going to pull all four of our intake pipes off these have T-bolt clamps, which are 10 mils. Usually they're eight mils, like any normal hose clamp. You know, just remove those accordingly. This is probably the easiest thing of all this. Now to do that three more times. 
all the intakes are off. You can stuff four rags in your intercooler pipes if you feel the need to do so. I'm not because I'm actually taking these intercoolers off. Let's start with the wiring. So this actually has phase two because it's a 95. So I have these nice clip styles where I just have to compress it with my finger and pull it off. These old school styles are a pain in the butt. You have to put a pick in there, pry it, and flick it off. Now this is my favorite pick to do so. You can get these at Harbor Freight for like two or three bucks. Push it in and pry it out. So we're gonna pull these off the front. We're gonna disconnect our PTU, which just has two connectors on the side. We'll just pull the wiring off and leave the PTU in place. We also have a crank angle sensor down here. If you have an early style, you'll have a clip that goes to the back. If not, it'll just take this off like any other new style connector. So we actually have a big assortment of vacuum lines here and I'm feeling these are likely ran to the boost controller to tee off the waste gates and your vacuum sources. So we're literally just gonna take all this apart because this is completely congesting everything in the middle. Look at that. <laughs> that plastic tee just snapped when I pulled on it. Wow. But just pull all your vacuum hoses there are plenty of diagrams online that you can reference. I'll put them in the description. So that way when you put this back together, you can worry about it then and kind of get a general idea. But also a big thing to do while the engine's out, perfect time to do all the deletes. So that way you don't have to worry about half of these vacuum lines or any other issues in the future. And then we're gonna snake this over here, just like we did these. And we're gonna pull them up and out the way over here. Your TPS has the same kind of retainer clip pull that off what I like to do when I pull them off pull them off past the locking tab and you can push it back on before you pull it all the way off to seat it back into place so you don't have to lose it or keep track of it now for a little bit more clearance we're actually gonna pull our idle air control since we're still on the wiring we'll do the TPS as well this spring clamp and this spring clamp you remove both of those and then you can kind of twist and contort it out and that'll give you a little bit more access here down to the sides of your engine also remove your brake booster hose that'll also help you get some clearance over here to mess with the wiring harness and other assorted things so i don't want to show you every single connector but i will run over them so you have a coil pack and a fuel injector for each cylinder you have two grounds you got one here that has two eyelets and then you have one back here there's also a fuel temp sensor right here that is a spade knock sensor should be right here on this stand your idle air connector you have a green and a blue idle connector there in the back those are literally the worst ones to get as long as you have a magnet on hand while using this pick you will be perfect you won't lose your clips and if you can or if you do then you can still find them if you haven't done your deletes you will have a prvr solenoid and an egr solenoid on the other side we're not going to worry about those until we lift the engine out and we get more access to them to pull them off easier it's way easier to do when you lift the engine out. I honestly wait to do a few things until we lift the engine out a little bit. You'll also have a VTC and knock sensor that should be mounted right here, but they're actually tucked down here. This is usually what people do just to kind of clean everything up. O2 is a three wire sensor and the VTC is a two wire sensor. They will be on the same harness plug. Don't get them mixed up with your two wire knock sensor back here. As far as this side, you still have all of that assorted stuff, but your VTC and knock sensor over here on this side harness. You also have your AIV connector down here. If you do have all that stuff, I do not believe the later models had AIV past 93. And like this is like the EGR connector. There's one of these down there on the bracket that connects to this outlet pipe. And those are the ones on both sides that we don't mess with. Your white wire here is always your VTC, which goes right back here on the back of your intake gear, or cam, I should say, my bad. That should cover all of your sensors. Unless you have a late model, there should be an EGR temp sensor somewhere here in the back. That will be a square black plug. It would be a plug shaped just like this. Now, if you have a stock untouched, twin turbo this is actually your wastegate solenoid connector so this goes to your wastegate solenoid down on the side so that potentially means this is your EGR back here now let's pull the rest of our harness off so we can move on to the next portion probably draining our radiator all the harness is disconnected now and unfortunately I lost the two clips back here for our idle air connectors now let this be a public service announcement change your hoses I took this hose clamp off as you can see, 
and I pulled up on this because I got the rear free and it literally just ripped off like nothing and disintegrated. So not only do you have your brake booster on a twin turbo, but you have your clutch booster right here. I'm gonna pull this hose, which then goes back here. And something else I learned, that EGR temp sensor is actually over here with your driver's side VTC and O2. So we actually ended up getting rained out yesterday. So we just threw everything in here and we paused. So the next step we're gonna take today is we're actually gonna lift the car up. I always lift it by the subframe. Do not lift it by the radiator support here. You will bow your radiator support and you will cause your hood to no longer line up and be flush with your headlights. Don't be that guy. So there's actually a butterfly drain on a radiator that we're looking to locate, and but we're gonna start by lifting the car up since we're basically done with everything on the top. Got it all up on blocks. Now let's begin the radiator drain. This is your drain. You may need some channel locks to get it started, but you just thread it out and drain your fluid. As long as you get it cracked loose, you should be able to open it the rest of the way with your fingers. So if you're not pulling your radiator, you absolutely need to pull your shroud off. This one appears to be held on by zip ties at this point. I'm going to assume that this radiator has been replaced. Yep, it's a CSF radiator. So this likely doesn't have the mounts in the correct position, but there's at least room for the mounts. You will have two down here. There's a screw holding it on right here underneath your radiator hose. And there's another one right here. So you take both of those off and then you can slide it straight out the top. However, if you have your lower shroud on right here, just unclip it out and pull it down. The two on the sides just clip in so it'll just slide out. Once you got most of your fluid drained out, at least half of it, loosen up your hose clamps for your upper radiator hose. Yank it off. Don't be like this guy and use RTV because you can't get the end of your hose to seal. Now we're going to pull both of our radiator brackets, our radiator overflow hose right here, and our lower J coolant hose. We're going to loosen these up. And instead of pulling the shroud separate, we're going to try to just lift it up with the lower shroud removed. This is how I do it most of the time. We should be able to, but it's going to be a really tight fit. everything's disconnected from the radiator I just hold my lower hose as I lift the radiator out actually you can keep your lower radiator hose on while you pull it out to kind of help you guide it snake it out as long as you hold this in to clearance your fan like this you can pull it out. If not, it'll get hung up on the blades. You'll just sit there and get stuck and be fighting yourself. Now we have that much more room for activities. Another little cheat so you don't sit here and keep dripping coolant the whole time you're working on everything. Take your upper hose, place it on your lower, and then even when you pull the motor and tilt it and whatnot, you won't spill coolant. If you did just take the shroud off, you can actually pull your fan out. You don't have to, but it's gonna make it a literal super tight fit. So before we do anything next up here, we're actually going to go underneath the car. We're going to take some PB blaster and we're going to hit a couple of the downpipe and exhaust bolt nuts or studs. Hit your hardware, get it soaking. So let's let this soak and let's move back up to the top of the car. Now let's disconnect our accordion pipes down here. They should be 8 mil bolts. Sometimes they have a spot for a flathead, however that one does not. This one over here is tucked down there pretty tight but it's right there as long as you get an extension on it with an 8 mil you can crack it loose and then it'll be loose when we come to pull the engine out we can pull that accordion pipe back because it compresses and we can bend it up and get clearance to pull it out to finish off the coolant system we can loosen up these heater core hoses and pop them off then everything coolant related is officially disconnected now i think we're actually going to pull the battery out strictly just for sun clearance reasons. Now when we're under the car, we'll have a lot more sunlight coming through this area. Now with the remainder of our AC compressor and our power steering pump, we're gonna remove our last thing, at least that I recall that we have up here on the top, and that's actually your alternator to transmission wiring. Just like that. So now we can just wait. When we start to pull the engine, we'll fish our harness back underneath this power steering line and between our AC lines. 
now raise your car up on blocks or jack stands whichever you prefer and now it's time to move underneath the car i think we're probably going to focus on our test pipes here first before we even get to our starter just for ease of access and things even though i'm about 99 percent sure it can come off regardless so i know i'm going to have a hard time with this hopefully not if you do use heat with an induction heater remove your three exhaust nuts here on your downpipe should be 14 mil if they're factory and then you have your two back here where your catalytic converters usually are these are aftermarket test pipes so there are no catalytic converters here let's try to pull these test pipes off see what kind of luck we have with our hardware and we'll report back for the next step just kidding we have not been able to get these bolts off before we have to pull the cutting wheel and stuff out we're going to remove the starter here we went ahead and removed this power wire i totally forgot to pull the camera out and i realized what i was doing so i went and grabbed the gopro so this is a 12 mil unless you have like a part store it could be a 13 and then you have your signal wire right here disconnect that now you have one 14 mil bolt up here sometimes there will be a stud here with a 14 mil nut sometimes they come out people replace them with bolts but these should both be 14 mils if not use whatever you need now you actually don't have to remove this bottom bolt all the way because it's slotted so you can slide it up twist it and drop it out now let's try to work some magic and see if we can get these things to be able to come out because i'm really not looking forward to it now when you got your bolts removed i will say odds are you're going to snap them that's totally fine it's better to snap them than to round them and literally be stuck you can either drill them out and just put bolts and nuts through it or you can take it to like a machine shop they can heat it up they can remove it or even like an exhaust shop should be able to do the same thing we also removed that was disgusting i also removed two of these bolts so it's completely unmounted you also have one more hanger up here that is a 12 mil nut that bolts to your transmission mount and as for this side we managed to get this one out successfully it actually threaded out without breaking the only way i could even get back here to get this off was with a hardened 14 mil socket with the combination of a swivel extension one of these bad boys that was just enough to be able to get it off honestly terrible design the flange should be flipped over like this that way you can go straight on at it any way that you'd like now let's finish dropping all this let's get our angle grinder cut this off and we'll report back once everything is off and we're on to the next step uh we got them out that is such a relief now we know 100 percent we're getting this engine out today because honestly, test pipes and exhausts are one of the biggest unknowns when it comes to pulling your motor. Next up, let's work on our heat shield. We're gonna remove this heat shield so we can get access to our drive shaft up here, like our center carrier bearing and our shifter assembly. You'll have four 10 mil nuts between here on both sides. A lot of them are busted off like this. Then you have two 10 mils back here up where it flattens out. So you actually need to remove this brace which is four 12 mils and that way you can flex and move your exhaust a little bit to get it out of the way to get access to the bolts now you drop it down you can slide it towards you with the slight prying of your cat back downwards or it just wants to get hung up so now you can see we have access to our center support bearing those are both 17 mil if i remember correctly if not they're 19s but i'm pretty sure they're 17s so the way you can remove your drive shaft the easy way without pulling your exhaust so here on the turbo rear end you actually have six bolts i believe and they're all allen keys these should be eight mil allen keys and if you remove all six of these and you also remove these two bolts what you can do is pry down on your exhaust to give your drive shaft room to pop out back here and since it swivels in the middle you can flop your drive shaft out the back enough to slide it back and then you can actually slide it out of the transmission enough to then point this front shaft downwards slide it and drop it out here or you can just continue to fish it around through the back it will help you a little bit to remove these two exhaust hangers right here they're both 12 mils and if you drop that down you will only have your rear portion holding it up and you'll have a lot more play even here right now with the hangers i think we have plenty of play to be able to pull this out 
So let's remove our hardware and we'll show you guys how we snake this out. Drive shafts now drop down. As soon as we let go of our carrier bearing bracket, it just plopped out of the diff. This one looks to be a lot less prone to seizing, unlike the NA one. Angle your drive shaft. Wow, I thought that was gonna hit me in the face. That was close. Now, once that's going towards the ground, instead of getting hung up in the back, you can slide this out. I also did remove both those hangers that I was mentioning, just so we could get a little bit more clearance. Now we're actually gonna pull this drive shaft all the way out at an angle, like so. And just like that. Your yoke should slide straight out of your trans with no issue. If it is, just slide it back and forth. Pry it back until it pops out. Now here we have access to our shifter that we can officially see. But you have a 12 mil nut on this striker bolt. Put a wrench here and a ratcheting wrench up here or a shallow 12 mil socket. Crack that loose. Then instead of pulling everything off to where I have to mess with the full interior, pull out the center console, pull this shifter support bracket and do all that, what I do is I just remove the two 12 mils from right here. It'll be worth it to spray some PB blaster up above it on the back side of these bolts just to help them come out. And I'll remove both of those on both sides and the striker rod. So then it drops down and I can leave my full shifter assembly up in the car. If it starts to get tight on you, just work it out slow. Try not to stretch it or snap it. Once you get your bolts out, it should have play up and down. And well, now our shifter is fully disconnected from the trans. Now I'm going to have to say we can do transmission wiring. There's actually a couple of like little flexible brackets on the side of the transmission that you kind of fold up and hang your wiring harness on. You have one red connector. You have one oval gray two wire connector. And then you have one of these square connectors that you have to pry the side up and pull it off. That's all the three you've got for your transmission wiring. We're almost ready to pull the transmission off. Before we do that, we have two 12 millimeter bolts holding our slave cylinder for our clutch system on. Kinda like that. It doesn't hang too low, so you can just loop it up in with something else you got up here. Next, we actually are going to remove the engine mount nuts. So the reason why you do your engine mount nuts before you do like your trans mount and stuff up here and so you can actually loosen it up so it has room to drop down back here. If not, it'll stay so tight and towards the front of the car that it won't flex enough to allow you to get the bell housing off of the trans because it'll hit the firewall. Those are located up here behind your steering rack. See that nut right there? 14 mil. Now swing yourself a jack under the car with a block of wood. It's not really necessary, it just helps make up the gap and raise it against the trans, slightly lift it up. Now remove six of your 14 mil trans mount bolts. While the trans is still bolted to the engine, you can drop it a little bit. You see it'll drop about three inches before it stops. It's likely because the engine is now hitting the firewall. And then raise it up about an inch, so I got about a two inch drop. Now it's time to take care of all the bell housing bolts. Sometimes you have these gusset plates on. You should from the factory. Not everyone puts them back on. But you'll have a bolt here, one up here on the back side, and you also have another one coming from the back side above that right here. How about I show you guys a transmission that's already out of the car? That'll probably be a lot easier. So here's the trans that we got. You'll have your two on the top. These will be your biggest pain in the butt. This is actually where your ground strap for your battery harness goes. So you will have an eyelet up here or disconnect your battery harness up by the battery. So that way the harness can come out with the engine because it is bolted to the engine or at least it should be. You got a bolt here. This is that bolt I said that was from the other side. One back here, one on the side, and then you have then you have these two right here on the bottom. Those last two will be for your other gusset plate on the other side of the engine. Everyone has their preferred method on how to do this. I prefer about a foot and a half of extensions. Some people prefer to use three to four foot of extensions. So you can get those two top bell housing bolts from the rear of the transmission by the tail shaft. You would do it right above on the shifter plate. Right up here. But in my opinion, this here is all you need. You need a swivel 
It's literally going to be your best friend here. If not, this is going to be nearly impossible. 14 mil. You also need your 14 mil wrench. Snake your extension and swivel up. Get the socket started on the bolt where you know it's on. Once I know it's on, I put the ratchet on the extension. While keeping it straight, we break it loose. And there's our bolt. You can get your top bolt right here from the side. But right there where I'm pointing, that's where that last bolt's at. So now let's go ahead and pull the rest of these out and then we'll move on to the next portion. Once you have all your bell housing bolts, this is where it starts to get fun. The reason we say that is because we are super close to pulling the motor out now. So here is how I pull the trans. I balance it right here in the center of the gearbox where it sticks out this little bit. And that's where I balance it with my jack. If you're doing this in gravel or something, try to get a mat like this where it's real stiff and sturdy and you're able to roll on it. If not, this is going to be much harder. And the way I suggest, rig up a ratchet strap to the rear of the trans, hook it up to like your sway bar, your rear end, and then slowly start to work your trans off and pull it off. Keep your jack under it at the same time. We're just going to give it its first wiggle. Try to split it up. You can see it's rocking, uh, shifting back and forth. That means it's now separated. Slowly let it down a little bit more. Continue to wiggle and pull. Slider off. Now it's just a matter of letting it down slow and keeping it balanced so that way you don't drop it on yourself. I just like to get the jack to a point where it's steady releasing pressure. Then I just sit and I hold the bell housing until we're all clear. I'll pull the jack out. Transmission is now pulled. We're gonna pull the trans out from under the car and we're gonna begin to lower the car back onto the ground. So I recommend you lift the front up about three inches with your jack so you can get the bell housing to clear your frame rail on the way out. If you're here, take a break, get a drink, enjoy yourself, because now it's time for the easy part. The Z is now pulled into the garage. Let's move everything back out the way. All of our boost controller vacuum lines, our wiring harness. Let's just try to peel everything out of the way so we can get the most direct onto the motor as possible. I think there's one thing that we need to do before we actually start to lift the engine out to get access to remove stuff to pull the engine out. Usually I like to lift up on the motor so then you can get a little bit more room to reach things such as your power steering J-hose and your high pressure line over here. Also when you lift it up a little bit you increase your chances of being able to get to this accordion hose in the, in the hose clamp to be able to pull that accordion hose off and then have more access to your power steering line. Now, if you have an air conditioning system hooked up, you actually have two AC lines that are down here at the bottom. And these are gonna be really tight to get to. Before we lift it, there is one thing that we can do here. Right here are your oil cooler lines. There's two eight mil clamps right here. Undo these and pop your oil lines off. And then they will stay to your engine and these hard lines go and connect your other soft lines that then go up to your oil cooler right here in the front. Don't forget to get a rag or something and drop it down there for when any residual leaks out so you make a little bit less of a mess. So once you're ready to lift your engine out, I recommend to pull your first two foil packs on both sides. And I personally like to run a chain through this runner, loop it back and bolt it together and run it across. If you have a nice plenum, you can put rags on the inside to keep it from actually grabbing on and breaking and scratching your paint off. If not, I recommend you actually grab an engine slinger so then you can help adjust the load and also that'll help you take your transmission out a little bit easier if you wanna keep them both together. I prefer to pull the trans separate, keeps you from beating up the firewall and you don't have to dump all of your trans fluid out. To me, that means everything. That's at least 60 bucks in fluid. Let's grab our engine hoist, let's roll it up and get our chain all hooked up. Now I left it unbolted so I could kind of show you guys something. You see how I ran this through this way and this side this way? Well, that is so I get off of this runner right here is where the first feed point is. So it's actually gonna balance from right here straight across. When you're lifting it, it'll try to get hung up on stuff. So doing this, you can keep it as straight as possible. And now all we're gonna do is just take a bolt and a nut and run it through straight here. 
and we're all hooked up. Once you have both chains bolted up and hooked up to your hoist, you can begin to lift it out. So I like to put a little bit of tension on the motor to where it starts to lift up the front of the chassis because it's pulling the weight until you see it move its first time. I like to grab the hoist and just yank it back. Since the transmission's not in, your engine will be laying it at kind of an angle and it'll be resting on the firewall. This way you can lift it up to where you begin to pull it and it comes straight out instead of straight into the firewall. If you can manage to leave it on to lift the engine out enough, you don't have to disconnect your air compressor. You can just unbolt these two bolts here and then you're following two right here. Pull the whole unit off and you don't have to break the system. You can just drop it down into your sway bar area and keep it kind of out the way. If not, you actually have right here two studs. You have a 12 mil nut on both of these. So I may have to get like two foot of extension to reach down there, but I can just see the nut right in between here and this little gap. Once you get it lifted high enough, really about six inches, maybe four will do it. And you have your accordion hoses uncooked. Just grab them and prime upwards. So we're just gonna leave them tilted up like this so that way they have nothing to get hung up on anymore. Now we have access to our power steering banjo bolt. I do not know the exact size, I just know that a 31 32nd socket fits. I don't even have big enough metric. Ooh, he has a tight banjo bolt. Make sure you got a pan in place. Catch all that power steering fluid. And just let all that fluid drain out. Now let's remove our J-hose from the bottom, which is an 18 mil, or sometimes I believe a flat header Phillips can get it. Because as of right now, it's like impossible to even see it's actually there right below that high pressure line so let's pull that off honorable mention i know i said something but make sure you disconnect your battery harness from your accessory wire and your 12 mil ground bolt from up here and you can just hook your harness up to your motor and leave it we actually got hung up on something on the other side and i completely forgot about it but your idle air control hard pipe actually has spots for your wiring harness to bolt onto maybe not bolt but clip so you want to separate them so you can actually pull the motor from the harness and not pull it with it now as we keep lifting every couple pumps we come around and we check and make sure everything is still being clearance just fine because last things that we want to do is destroy this ac system so you can also see we've got it so high up now that this accordion hood is actually accessible so you could pull your pcv and that accordion eight mil and pop that whole unit off and give you a little bit more room you can see all the power steering is unhooked but for your alternator and trans wire you actually have a little bracket down here that has a plastic clip that holds it into place you can either cut the zip tie or just pry it usually it'll come out and then you want to feed your under the headlight wiring which is actually your alternator and transmission wiring back here behind your power steering and then back through and now it's officially free and it's not going to get hung up upon removal we actually have one final thing that we did not get and that's the ac system so once you crack this loose if you begin hearing any hissing just crack it loose the rest of the way and walk away you're actually going to be releasing the freon out of your system r12 r134a whichever and i promise the last thing you want to do is be sitting here breathing that in thankfully it seems like this system is not short we're actually resorting to removing this accordion hose i'm having the hardest time over here I actually like it. I love any bit of extra access we can get. Now you can see those two 12 mils. Let's knock that off. Let's pull our motor out. As we sit here and we just keep lifting this out, we just keep going back, checking over here, make sure we don't hit anything. And the same thing back here, just to make sure we're not grabbing anything on the way out. Just keep trucking. Once you know everything is out of the way, just continue to lift the motor until you get clearance to make the oil pan over your latch. I guess maybe I should take this uh, boost sensor off. That would probably help. I totally forgot about your stock boost sensors. These are these square plugs here on the side. You definitely want to pull these out. Once you got it high enough, you're going to slide it out. One last pull. Of 
course, we got to knock our GoPro off for the last step. Well, I'm officially frustrated. There was way too many things in this car. Boost controllers, wide bands, stupid security systems, everything. There's just so many dumb things that the previous owner did to this. There was a ridiculous amount of hosing for a boost controller. Like, come on. It's literally absurd. There's probably three times as much hose on this as there needed to be. Also, don't be an absolute idiot like me and leave your overflow hose to just completely drain all over your freaking floor. Yeah, I did that. And I just dumped brake fluid on my shoe. The car's officially all finished, at least in the aspect of us finishing what we have started. Now it's time that we can start doing literally anything we want which is actually going to be putting this NATT swap in it as long as this chassis checks out. There's been a lot of rust on it from when I've been looking over it, making this video and actually digging into it. So I'm gonna have to weigh my options if this thing is worth the save or if we need to, you know, send it down the line. I don't want to, but sometimes you have to. I hope I clarified a couple things for you guys on how to pull your VG30 DETT out of your Nissan 300ZX and hopefully you guys can tackle this yourself. Get your engine out, get it up on the stand and get it ready to do any bit of maintenance or service that you can. Because let's be honest, these are engine out type of cars. Anytime you take the engine out, do everything that you can. We're going to clean up the shop now. We're about to go out for our nightly hike then come home and edit this video for tomorrow. Hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, please don't forget to drop a like and subscribe down below. Stay tuned for more content and we will catch you guys in the next one. Peace.